so, so who you see on the screen here is Massimo. So, so Massimo is smiling, but he's not a lucky boy. He inherited one bad gene from his mom and one bad gene from his dad, and now he has mental retardation, he has spasticity, and there is no cure that we can offer him. We or the medical profession can offer him. That is the kind of stuff that drives me. So, so, so why is that? Uh, uh, and, I'll, uh, and I'll get to that. I'll explain that to you why, why I think that is. Now, Massimo is not alone. I mean, he was the first patient of a new genetic disease. We now know that there are 20, 30, maybe hundreds of patients like him. But that's only one rare disease. And we're talking about rare diseases. One in a thousand births is rare. But there are many of these diseases. We don't, many of them, we don't know what the gene is that causes it. We don't know what the cell type in the brain is that causes the problem. And there's no cure for it. Unacceptable. So, so if you're talking about the brain, you're talking about the most complex machine that we know that exists on Earth and maybe in the universe. Uh, this, little, this little ball here contains more than 80 billion cells that make trillions of connections and they impart us with this amazing problem-solving ability, uh, the ability to show empathy towards our fellow citizens, to other species, uh, and really it was what makes us human. So, so, so we should be interested in that, and, we, and we're taking it for granted most of the time, until the moment that something goes wrong, until the moment that you have a son that has a de uh, developmental brain disease, until the moment that you develop a small blood clot and part of your brain dies, or until the moment that one of your relatives gets Alzheimer's disease. Because believe me, you live long enough, your brain will start to degenerate. So. So that immediately brings me to the point of what, why am I doing this? What, why have I dedicated my life and the life of my lab to this, to this pursuit? Well, the first one is an economic one. It's obvious. Alzheimer's disease costs Australia $6 billion uh, at the moment, of which we only spend half a percent on research, by the way. But in 2050, 3% of our GDP is going to go there. So, so this, there's an economic imperative to do something about that, and that's only one age-related disease. The, the second one is a clear moral one. I have to talk to the parents of Massimo and of, of other diseases that we are involved in and look them in the eye and say, like, I, I will be able to do something about this in the future. So, so and I think as a society, we need to, we need to address this. And, and the last one is really... Uh, 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 a curiosity, a scientific, a philosophical one, uh, which is, what is consciousness? Uh, what makes us so specifically human? What is so special about our brain? Uh, and, and can we understand that? So, so that's why I've been working on that, and will be working on that for the rest of my career. So, so why do we know so little about the human brain? I mean, you, we know we can image it, we can we can interrogate it. But let me try this out on you. So, so who would like to donate, donate to me a part of your living brain so I can study it? <coughs> Nobody. See, that's the thing. And then how many women do you think will donate their fetuses to research so that we can study brain development of the human? Nobody. Of course not. It would be wrong to do that. And that's why we know a lot about mice, but we know very little about humans. And I put to you that it's important that we start to know about human development because you do not have to be a rocket or a neuroscientist to see that the mouse brain is smaller uh, and that it makes less connections and, and that it's a kind of bit simpler than the human one. And, and, and of course, mice have specialized in making more babies. We have specialized in becoming highly cognitive smart uh, 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 primates that are problem solvers. So we have taken different routes. But that also means that we need a human model system to look at human brain diseases. And that's why a stem cell scientist, instead of a neuroscientist, is talking to you today. So how do we do that? Well, we take advantage of, 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 a, of a, a revolutionary breakthrough in medicine, really, that is going to fuel uh, a medicine in the 21st century, and that's cell reprogramming. So what is now possible, and what does my lab do on a daily basis? We can take a skin biopsy, or a blood sample, 
or even urine derived cells for God's sake, and reprogram them in the lab into a stem cell that is equivalent to a day five embryo when you were a day five embryo. And that stem cell can make every single cell type of the human body. That's kind of cool. That's amazing, really. Because that allows me to make every single cell type of your brain. And it will allow me to capture your genetic makeup, the way that your genes interact. And it will also allow me to capture your disease. I can go to Massimo, harvest his skin cells, make his brain in a dish, and start to study it. That's revolutionary. And that's why we're working on that. Now, now, how have we used that technology over the last five to eight years that I've been at the AABN and UQ? Well, one of the things that we've done is to make stem cells from people with Down syndrome. Everybody knows people with Down syndrome, even though it becomes less prevalent. They have an extra chromosome 21. But what most people don't know is that all people with Down syndrome develop Alzheimer's disease by 40 years old, all of them. And that's because of genes and chromosome 21. So what have we done? We've taken molecular scissors and started to cut out bits of chromosome 21 to find out which ones are the drivers of Alzheimer's disease and Down syndrome, so that we can learn about Alzheimer's disease in the general population. Another way what we can do is to take skin cells from kids with ataxia tagliatasia that have a mutation in a gene that, that, that prepares DNA uh, mutations or DNA breaks. These kids end up in a wheelchair because their heart brain degenerates. Nobody knows why. We can't do anything about it. We have taken skin cells from them, turned them into brain cells of the heart brain, and are now screening drugs. And Massimo, we're working on him as well. We have his, his stem cells growing in a dish, and his, his parents come into my lab and see their own son's brain cells growing there, and we're screening drugs, and it's looking good. So, so why is, is that enough? Why is it called mini brains? Well, because we realized that growing cells in 2D is really not going to cut it if you're thinking about a human brain that's highly interconnected. And then we take an advantage of something that these stem cells do. They are amazing. If we take stem cells coming from skin, turning them into uh, neural stem cells, and we aggregate them in a clump together, and we allow them to grow in a dish, or in a hydrogel, or in a bioreactor where we just quietly stir them for about 100 <coughs> days, these cells are starting to recapitulate early human brain development. And we were, we were amazed, the field was amazed. There's an intrinsic program in the stem cells of the brain that allows you to form uh, a part of our human brain. That's amazing. So those mini brains, <laughs> I think there's one, one in your package. They, they, they are not like that, okay? <laughs> They're not like a smaller version of the real thing, if, although eventually they will. What they really are, are small subsections of the brain that, for example, the outer cortex of the brain that we can grow in the dish. So that's, that's not so bad, really, if you think about it. I can grow part of the, 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 the part of your brain where you do your most complex thinking in the dish, and it's going to be your uh, cerebral cortex. So what we think it allows us to do, and we are doing that now, and the field is doing this now, you can start to ask questions, what goes wrong during development of the brain? What, what kind of wrong connections are made in autism and or schizophrenia? Um, like, what happens if you make uh, a damage, a trauma to the brain? Can you repair that? We are learning about how to repair a brain. So we call those mini-brains. And it's not the right term, I explained it to you. They're really brain organoids. Now, they are small still. <laughs> now, they are not they are half the, or, or a third of a, of a 20 cent piece. So don't think about these huge uh, things in a dish. But what it allows us to do is, and, and again, this is quite amazing, when we listen in to these little brain organoids, in other words, we're putting electrodes on it, like you would interrogate a car, uh, like this, we see that these little mini brains are having autogenic electrical activity. That freaked us a little out of the bit, must say. I mean, just imagine it. These are cells that are coming from your skin or from skin of kids, turn into uh, uh, brain cells. 
making little mini brains that are thinking by themselves, dreaming, I would call it, but I was telling them anything to do, uh, to do anything. So, so that's kind of really good for us. We were excited about it, but it allows us to look at this neuronal connectivity where most of these diseases sit. But at the same time, it is an area where we ourselves become uncomfortable and where you should become uncomfortable. Right? And this is one of the reasons why I relish the opportunity to talk to you today at the TEDx talk, because it's so important that we, as a, as a society, as a community, are starting to make our mind up where that balance should lie. Where is that balance between pushing boundaries to cure really bad diseases and prevalent and economically impactful diseases and the ethical lines that we want to draw as a society say like, well, this is okay. That is where we need to draw the line. So in this case, uh, we're using, as I said, electrical activity, but we also use light to listen in into, these, into these human brain organoids. So, so really what I'm hoping, what I hope I've done is, is three things. One is, 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 is explain to you how this fast moving field is going to change medicine in the future. Because changing genes in your stem cells uh, it will allow us to, to correct genetic defects, uh, interrogate the molecular basis of disease. This is what's called precision medicine. This is coming. At the same time, I hope I've given you an appreciation, appreciation of, of how much we can do for diseases that are currently incurable, how much we can understand. But at the same time, I've, I hope I've get, made you pause and think about where these ethical boundaries should be. Because somebody said once, well, and this is the current thinking, and maybe my psychologist friends can, can correct me, is that consciousness is an, a self-emergent property of, of sufficiently connected human neurons. Well, we are making bigger neuro, uh, 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 mini brains as we speak by putting vasculature in there. So, so at some stage, maybe these human skin cell derived mini brains are going to show uh, conscious, uh, consciousness. I don't know how I would tell that, uh, nor, but, but it does make me wonder, you know, and it does address that question, philosophical question, about what makes us human, what is consciousness, and, and, and how, do we, how do we think, and can we start to look at the molecular correlates of that? So, so help us engage in this conversation with us, inform yourself about this so that we can educate ourselves and make those balanced decisions together. And that's where I'm going to leave it. Thanks.